Doing a cheese hati goodie. Nichiana Gutier do a sock. My name is Lane Reinhardt, and in collaboration with the Alaska Heritage Institute, we are releasing a variety of videos documenting the preparation of the materials needed to weave a chokat robe. And today I'm going to share something very special with you. This is mountain goat wool or a Jean Wu in Clinket. Um, it's a very special material and it comes to us here in Juneau from Kodiak Island in Alaska. I was blessed to have received it from, you know, a family of hunters up north and um, it's just a really special thing and I think one of the important things to take into consideration when working with our, you know, traditional materials is to have a sense of reverence and respect for it. You know, this bean gave its life and um, in order to, for me to be able to, you know, go through this process of working on the materials for a chokat robe. And so I say to it, uh, Gunish Chish, um, Ta'a in my mother's language. And it's just a really special thing um, in order to continue to work with this fiber. It is what our ancestors worked with. It is what we work with today and, you know, into the future as well, um, extending beyond ourselves in the present day. So um, I think of, you know, sort of, you know, this area where the mountain goat even lives as being this really sacred place. And Clinket, we would call it Jean Wu Ani, or mountain goat land. And I feel like it kind of represents this place in between the celestial realm with the sun and the stars and the moon and our place down here on earth. So it is a really special place and mountain goats are absolutely sacred, wonderful beings. And so I'm going to you know, continue to run my combs you know, through it to try to even it out, straighten the fiber, um, make it more readily easy to manipulate later when I spin it. So as you can see, there's a variety of different kind of textures initially when you were working with it. And, you know, this, the point at this point is just to make it, um, you know, just a little bit more readily available um, for us later on. And so I have, you know, some fiber that's sort of clumping, um, you know, on this one. And, you know, let's not worry about it too much at this point. I can, you know, either continue to work with it, it'll get straighter and straighter, or you know, as I need to, I can probably at this point, I might, you know, even remove this one and then I will, you know, or, you know, I can turn my combs and, you know, get everything onto my right comb instead. And then, so I'm going to go ahead and you know, move it back this way. And then what I've heard this referred to as almost like sky to the ground. And so um, I'm going to move my comb this way now and we're going to see here that there's a little bit more tension that's being created with the two combs on the fiber. And I'm getting some nice pulls now, and I can really see these start to straighten now. And it's a pleasure to see. And I will repeat this process probably a couple more times here. Um, really just trying to make this almost like nice and fluffy like clouds. I feel like when I work with Mountain Go, it reminds me of you know, just seeing those beautiful clouds on a, you know, a beautiful sunny day in Southeast Alaska when we are able to have those days. It's always just magical and um, serene. And, you know, I've been working with mountain goat fiber on and off for quite a number of years now. And, you know, there was a period where I just, you know, I try to take it with me where, you know, where I go if I'm outside, especially because, you know, the guard hairs can, you know, tend to be a little messy. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing this necessarily indoors unless you have a dedicated space um, to your craft. Or, you know, just be really conscientious and clean up afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and flip these combs back up and I'm going to run it through again. Yeah, and now I feel like I'm getting some really nice good pulls here. Um, beforehand, it was a little bit... Um, the mountain goat was just kind of clumping and moving, you know, directly and not really kind of getting that nice straightened effect that I was looking for earlier on. And, you know, it may not look like much right now, but, you know, the fascinating thing about all of this is that um, later I'll show you how I can kind of pull the fiber from the combs and I'll end up with some beautiful pieces that will be good for spinning later on.
Yeah, it's already starting to fluff up real nice and it used to be kind of a little bit more jagged, um, you know, depending on, you know, the part of the animal that you received your wool from or, you know, maybe even the time of year that the hide was collected. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and you know, flip it again, try to get all this hair on one piece. And then I'm going to sky to the ground it. I'm going to actually probably remove this stuff. I've been told that, you know, um, what is kind of left on the comb is maybe, you know, fibers that are a little bit shorter. Um, maybe you wouldn't want to work with them as much. Um, I'll, you know, I'll save them and run them through the comb again with other ones. And go ahead and you know, sky to the ground it. Try to get up all back. Oh yeah, I'm getting real nice pulls now. You can kind of feel it. Feels really good to kind of feel the tension that's being created. And you know, at this point, I'm actually working quite a bit harder than I was initially. And I might even, after this one, go ahead and after I've moved all the wool from this comb to the other one, um, I'll go ahead and show you what I mean by, you know, I can pull it later in order to create um, sort of roving in order to spin with it later on. I met a real wonderful weaver, Megan O'Brien. Um, she is Kawakiwak and Haida from British Columbia, Canada, and she kind of you know, gave me some pointers on how to work with mountain goat wool um, a number of years back. And, you know, that, that information was invaluable. And when I think of um, how we just took the time and had the patience and dedication to work with this fiber, just um, how magical that really was. And, you know, um, today we thigh spin, you know, our warp, which is the thicker yarn hanging from the loom. But it also used to be that we would have thigh spun our mountain goat wool weft yarns, which is the finer stuff that you weave across with. And um, she took me through that process for a little bit of time and it, it really blew my mind just the amount of, you know, dedicated time um, to learn that expertise and, you know, just, you know, amazing, amazing, you know, finesse and, um, you know, just attention to detail in order to create a really nice, fine, even weft yarn. So almost done with this one here. You can see that I kind of went from, you know, some kind of clumps of wool to the sort of nice fluffy material that I have almost reached at this point. Um, almost done here. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this wool and I will run it through later um, with some other collected ends and I'll kind of give you an idea of what I meant by pulling it, you know, at the end. And so now, you know, it takes a little bit of grip strength. Thankfully, I've been kind of working on that with the pull-ups and, you know, just trying to make my body nice and you know, strong so I can do the things that I enjoy and love, you know, throughout my life. So you never, you kind of get an idea of, you know, just how much goes into doing this when you, you have to pull it. And, you know, the longer uh, materials you can use with uh, the longer pulls of wool that you can use when it comes to spinning, um, it sure does make your spinning go a lot faster. You don't have to continually splice as much um, and you know keep adding and so that means you can spin just a lot faster if you have a nice you know long piece of wool you know I, perhaps even ideally you know arm length because it really does eat up a lot of time when you're you know either adding small strips of cedar bark or small pieces of wool to what you have already started to spin so i'm gonna just kind of resituate this really quickly and just try to get it nice and even throughout, um, which really affects, uh, you know, the weaving later on. You know, you want your 
your warp and materials to be as even as possible um, when you're when you're weaving otherwise you know you have some variation in you know the shaping of you know the form line shapes that we emulate in chill cat weaving um, and you know I think that there's this kind of saying amongst us weavers that sometimes like no one would ever notice unless they were another weaver but you know kind of you know you try to hold yourself to you know a particular standard and you know from here I can even just sort of I think kind of pull it with my hand a little bit more and kind of go through and you know so there's some areas here that are a little bit um more um you know dense and I'm gonna try to move that fiber around and you know later on I can kind of just like we would with uh commercial roving merino wool um you know, I can split this, you know, into relatively even pieces. Um, you know, this is not as long as it could have been, but you know what? I think it's beautiful nonetheless. You know, just the the texture of it is a pleasure to work with. It's so soft and delicate. Um, really one of the most beautiful fibers, um, I think, on the planet, really. And, you know, just to think of... You know the fact that wow you know these beautiful creatures you know spend their time on the the mountainside and you know the hillside and now you know they're here with us down you know by sea level keeping our spirits warm all right goodness chi shanti goody hope to see you again soon thank you for joining me